the Chartered Environmentalist with over 13 years postgraduate experience in public and private sector services. Oshin is has developed a broad range of experience while working throughout Ireland and Northern Ireland in several areas, including renewable energy, environmental monitoring, environmental compliance, waste management. Prior to joining ORS, Oshin spent five years as an environmental manager and subsequently plant manager of two large-scale commercial biogas facilities under the EPA and DAFM licensed conditions gaining an in-depth knowledge of anaerobic digestion and CHP operation and maintenance, renewable biomethane, carbon dioxide production, bio-CNG systems and transportation, biogas feedstock sourcing and analysis, organic waste management, including ABP regulations, environmental licensing compliance, ISO 14000, environmental management systems. Luke Weimer is an executive director with John Spain and Associates, part of the ORS group, one of the foremost planning and development consultancies in Ireland. Luke leads an expert team specialising in management and preparation of planning applications for large-scale industrial energy infrastructure and commercial development, in addition to residential retail and mixed-use projects. Luke is a member of the Irish Planning Institute and is a member of the Executive Committee of the Royal Town Planning Institute in Ireland. Luke holds a BA and Master's in Regional and Urban Planning and holds an additional qualifications in Project Management, Environmental Management, Planning and Environmental Law. So I'll hand over now to Oshin to commence the pre presentation. Thanks very much, Al. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, get the opportunity to sp speak to the group this evening. And thanks very much to the Midlands branch of Engineers Ireland for facilitating the talk tonight. Uh, just a quick background to ORS and John Spain Associates. Um, this is a just an overview of the services that, that we offer. Um, very much multi multidisciplinary building consultancy, um, offering services um, under the ten pillars here. Ranging from civil civil and structural engineering, project management, infrastructure, health and safety right through to planning services, um, which are offered by John Spain and Associates. To, to, just to give you an overview of our specialist services to the biogas industry and, and biogas developments, we, we offer services right from feasibility study stage through to the planning application, environmental impact assessment, licensing and permitting, technical er expertise in terms of biogas plant operation, um, and also license compliance. So as Alan said in the overview of the presentation, we, we'd like to begin just by giving you a very, very high level uh, introduction to the biogas process itself, um, introducing the key key elements within uh, the biogas process and give you a virtual tour of uh, a plant that, that we worked on recently um, at ORS. Um, and successfully brought through the, the planning system. So if, you, if you, we were discussing the the early pioneers in AD in Ireland, the, the process itself would have been very much biogas to CHP for electrical generation to supply power to the grid. Um, this isn't the most efficient use of biogas um, in terms of energy production. So in, in recent years across Europe uh, and in Ireland, um, the model has changed to bio, biogas upgrading. So that involves the the, se the separation of uh, CO2 from the raw biogas to create two streams, uh, one biomethane and the, the other biogenic CO2. Biomethane itself is almost chemically identical to, to natural gas and can be injected directly to the national grid uh, without much pain. Um, this can be used as a transport fuel, um, a, a general fuel, and biogenic CO2 can also be used um, in the beverage industry, for example. There is a global shortage of, of CO2, so this this uh, forms a valuable product from the, the overall AD process. Digested um, is the other product that comes from the process. This is a valuable organic fertilizer and soil improver. Um, this is the product that will can be supplied to, to end users um, as uh, 
to return nutrients to land. I mentioned there, uh, biomethane again, it can seamlessly replace natural gas to, to uh, be injected directly into the national grid. And CO2 and digested are, are the other two main products from, from the process. Uh, at this point, I'll just pause um, just to get a feel for, for the audience tonight. If anyone has direct experience in, in AED or AED plant development or operations, please just uh, add a comment or a yes or a thumbs up into the chat uh, just to let us know. Um, some of this will be well known to you, but um, we just want to give a high level high level introduction to the to a biogas plant itself using uh, uh, a development we've worked on of late as, as an example. So the example we're using here in terms of output scale, it's a 40 to 60 gigawatt hour scale plant. Uh, producing biomethane from, from raw biogas. The feedstock composition is very much agricultural in its nature, uh, formed mainly from manures such as poultry litter, cattle slurry, cattle manure, uh, and other crops such as grass silage. The overall feedstock volume we're talking about here is in the range of 60 to 80,000 tonnes per annum um, of locally sourced agricultural feedstocks. I've just highlighted this report here by Gas Networks Ireland. Many of us might be familiar with this. There's interesting detail in this report. GNA collated information from AD developers um, that were interested in developing AD in Ireland um, and gives very good information on the potential for biomethane development in Ireland. So I'd like to just kick off by giving a, a virtual tour of sorts of a facility we, we recently de developed and brought through the planning system uh, beginning in 2002 um, and through 2003. This uh, is a view looking north through the site. You can see on the left hand side here um, a covered silage clamp and the background um, is a concrete roof digester. Uh, this is a, a style uh, offered by a particular uh, technical provider. And we'll just walk through, if we begin at the silage clamp here. Um, so within this, there's four, ba four bays um, for the safe storage of silage. Um, the waste reception building at the northeast corner here, this is which under the EPA license is kept under a negative pressure. That's a sealed airtight building. All ABP-based solid feedstocks are stored securely in this building um, to ensure they're not open to the elements um, for bi biosecurity reasons. There's feed systems within this building. Um, and as I mentioned, the building is kept under negative pressure uh, with an odor abatement system uh, attached. You can just see the stack sneaking out behind there. If we move clockwise through the site now, through to the primary digestion, so the, the feedstocks are, are fed forward into this primary digestion tank, uh, heated to between 35 and 40 degrees and continuously stirred uh, to allow the bacteria to do their work uh, and release the biogas from, from the substrate. In this particular plant, there's then secondary digestion. Um, this style of tank might be familiar to most of these. The, the double membrane gas hood is visible there. Um, the, this, the gas that's collected, the primary digestion here is fed forward. Uh, and this is the single storage for uh, biogas on site. The next step in the digestion process of the, is the pasteurization of the substrate, which is a, a key element in this plant because it's uh, processing and handling animal byproducts. So under DATHAM license conditions, pasteurization is, is a key element there to ensure that uh, no pathogens uh, uh, remain in the, the final digestic product. So the, all material here will be pasteurized to 70 degrees for a minimum of 60 minutes to ensure that, that all pathogens are killed off. The next structure then uh, is digested separation. So in this particular plant, they've opted for two-stage separation. So they have a centrifugal 
separation here along with screw press separation to separate the fiber uh, element from the, the liquid fraction. Um, so essentially creating two forms of digestate. Uh, the solid fraction, which is very similar to compost and structure, uh, and a concentrated digestate liquid. Within this site as well, they have um, further digestate treatment, uh, which is an industrial reverse osmosis system, which essentially dewaters the digestate further. Um, the water is returned to the process, uh, and what they're left with is a high nutrient value concentrated liquid digestate. In terms of the gas flow on this site, obviously the gas is collected in the primary and secondary digestion. I've highlighted the CHP plant here. So the CHP generation here, the heat power generation, is solely for the parasitic load of the site. So all heat and power generated on site are used on site to ensure that the site is self-sufficient in terms of its energy demand. The biogas upgrading system uh, is a key element as well, separating the CO2 from the, the biomethane. Um, that CO2 is then compressed and liquefied um, and sent off-site as, as biogenic CO2. Uh, the biomethane itself is supplied to the national grid via the biomethane network entry facility you see highlighted there uh, towards the south of the site. Just to give you an overview of the processes within that, um, all solid feedstocks are, will be fed through feed systems such as this. This is just a particular de design from a German manufacturer, a walk-in floor type feeder uh, suitable for grass silage and other solid feedstocks such as poultry litter uh, and horse manure, similar, similar manure solid feed, feedstock types. So this um, walk of floor slowly feeds solid feedstock forward. It's often linked to a maturation pump uh, to ensure that the particle sizes um, of the feedstock are, are as small as possible for easier digestion. I mentioned combined heat and power there, an important factor in many biogas plants. Uh, Alan mentioned a trip to Germany last week. I was also on that trip and we had the opportunity to visit uh, a particular CHP manufacturer there. Um, this is just a, an example of some of the engines they're producing at that site uh, in Northwest Germany to help help visualize the, the technology. The four main biogas upgrading technologies that are commonly used are membrane separation, pressure swing absorption, amine scrubbing, and water wash. Some of these can be combined together, such as amine scrubbing and water wash scrubbing. Um, and the, the imagery there is of an amine scrub, scrubber based system uh, also in Germany. So the, I suppose the simple objective behind all of these systems is to strip the CO2 from the raw biogas um, uh, to form that, those two key renewable gas streams, CO2 and 99% plus biomethane. The Bioneath Network Entry Facility, the GNA facility that, that will be included um, within the footprint of, of many of these biomethane to grid CHP or biogas sites, uh, just to help visualize the this is the standard drawn from Gas Networks Ireland um, on the, the, the layout of, of that particular piece of infrastructure. So this is where your gas will directly meet the grid. Um, Within this, uh, there's modern equipment to ensure the, the quality of the gas um, to ensure that it meets the requirements for, for the national grid. We touched briefly on digested. Um, a very important byproduct of the, the AD process. Um, because it's been through the process, the, the form of nitrogen within it is, is more readily available to the crop. So it, it is a, a valuable fertilizer, not just for, for nitrogen, but also P and K. And just a note there that there are certain environmental benefits from digestate uh, versus chemical fertilizer. 
uh, one of the key benefits of an AD plant is this creation of a circular local circular bioeconomy, whereby local local agricultural operators supply the plant with slurry, manures, and other feedstocks, uh, and receive digested in return. Obviously, there's the benefit of removing the potential greenhouse gas emissions from manures and slurries, which would other, otherwise be decomposing on farms. But another key benefit is that this nutrient-rich digestive and, or, and soil improver is displacing uh, chemical manufactured uh, fertilizer that would other, otherwise be imported to, to local farms. So some key, key savings there in terms of oil, tonnage of water use and tons of CO2 emissions that are associated with chemical fertilizer manufacturing and um, importation. There are further digested treatment options such as separation, dewatering, drying, pelletization and nutrient recovery. Um, very much down to an, an operator's preference. Um, the image I've shown here is just digested separation. Um, I mentioned it briefly earlier, um, where, whereby the solid fraction uh, is, is removed from the liquid fraction. And a key, a key driver, I suppose, behind the the want for digestate is the rising cost of chemical fertilizers. Um, so, you know, it's a one-one for the farmer uh, and that there's huge greenhouse gas emission savings, but there's also a uh, an economic benefit to farmers to use digested over and above chemical fertilizers. So I hope I hope that was a good visual aid of of um, typical layout of a biogas plant and the, and the key processes within. Uh, this plant was delivered through planning in twenty twenty three. Thankfully, it was approved. Um, the timeline on that was from submission to approval was just short of six months, uh, which is quite unusual. Um, and, and I know Luke's going to uh, speak to the planning process later, but um, a six month turnaround on plan is, is quite unusual for, for Ireland in that context. It's good going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just just to set the scene, I suppose why we're all here tonight, and why why there is such such focus on on biomethane specifically across media um, in the last few months. At a, at an EU level, um, I'll not delve too deeply into Red Two, uh, the Renewable Energy Directives. I think many of us will be familiar with these. I've highlighted the Repower EU strategy there, which was published in twenty twenty two. This was on the back of concerns around um, the safety of supply of, of gas, particularly from Russia, um, following the, the war in Ukraine. So this, the EU set specific targets within that to increase um, biomethane production specifically across, across the EU. So the target set by the Repower EU plan was 350 terawatt hours by 2030. Um, and I've highlighted where we are currently in 2024 here. So you can see the targets within that particular EU strategy are eight, eightfold um, where, where production is, is at the minute. Um, so they're lofty targets. Uh, and just to talk about those targets on a national level here in Ireland, there's a lot of talk about the national target um, within CAP 23, CAP 24 of 5.7 terawatt hours um, of biomethane production by 2030. So this, this would achieve 10% of total gas usage as it is at the moment, um, but it would require 150 to 200 medium to large scale plants by 2030. Um, we'll give a brief overview shortly of where we are now and that should should help illustrate you know, you know where we need where we need to get in the the level of development that has to happen uh, to try and achieve those targets. Again, just to reiterate, there's only six short years until twenty thirty, um, and not not a lot of time. Luke is going to speak to the timelines involved in the planning process and the development process shortly. Um, 
just to sort of re reiterate the the level of of what needs to happen to achieve this target. So the potential. Here's where we are currently as of 2024. Um, there's approximately 30 operational biogas facilities in Ireland. This includes AD sites, landfill sites, um, and nine wastewater treatment plants that are they're currently capturing the biogas. The majority of these sites um, were based on the biogas to CHP model, i.e. generating heat and electricity. Um, there's two sites that are currently operational that are producing biomethane. And there's the growth has been very slow. There's only been eleven new facilities since twenty seventeen. So um, we need to see an accelerating acceleration um based on the national targets. There's two there's one central injection point uh in Cush in County Kildare and one planned for Mitchell Sound in County Cork. So these are, are centralized grid injection points that would receive uh, compressed biomethane. Um, generated and, and uh, off-site. So the EC has identified Ireland as having the highest potential for biomethane production per capita of any country in Ireland, or in Europe, sorry. And the key question is why? Well, very simple question. We have very productive agri-food industry in Ireland, as we all know, huge livestock numbers. And with livestock comes a huge amount of manure. Uh, this piece of research here highlights the density of um, biogas potential from, from the amount of manure available um, across the EU states. Um, and as you can see from the colour code in there in the, the island of Ireland, uh, generally, we're sort of in that range of 100 to 2,000 2, tonnes per, per kilometre squared of readily available manure to be used as a feedstock for, for the biogas industry. Add to that, this piece of research by the SEAA in 2015 highlighted uh, the availability of slurry uh, and also the, the potential for grass, silage or silage-based feedstocks to supply uh, an indigenous biogas industry. So the, in terms of feedstock supply, the, the potential is certainly there, uh, as this research shows. And a huge driver as well, and a huge reason why, why there is potential for the industry is the absolute necessity to tackle greenhouse gas emissions from um, our, our thriving agricultural industry. So you can see there in 2023, the EPA uh, research has shown that 38.4% of greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland came from the agricultural industry. So uh, by comparison, 19% was contributed to the transport sector as a whole. So what, what would this look like? What would the development of the industry look like in Ireland? Um, this information is taken from, from the proposed um, the draft biomethane strategy. Again, the national target there of 5.7 terawatt hours of biomethane production. 150 to 200 medium scale facilities by 2030. The feedstock, which we mentioned, mainly based on crops, agricultural manures and slurries. And this level of biomethane production is sufficient to displace 15% of the current commercial and industrial natural gas consumption. In terms of distribution of the gas, then there is there is the proposal for small small scale plants to be connected connected through a virtual pipeline uh, to transport compressed biomethane to centralized grid connection points, such as the the facility in Cush and Mitchellstown that we that we mentioned earlier, and medium to large scale plants um, have may have the ability to direct connectly to the gas network, so. Gas Networks Ireland um, are excellent in terms of facilitating feasibility assessments uh, for grid connections for potential developers. So uh, virtual pipeline, uh, the, the term sounds confusing, but, but just to help visualize the virtual pipeline, uh, essentially what we have here is a bank of 12 um, 
reinforced units um, that hold biomethane, 100% biomethane, up to 250 bar of pressure that can be transported by road uh, and then decompressed at a central grid connection point. So I showed this graph to Luke earlier and, and he, uh, he commented that it sort of visualizes the level of development that has to take place. So you can see here we're six years out from 2030 um, and the red line here shows the, the number of new plants per annum that would likely be required to achieve the national targets of 5.7 terawatt hours of production. So if, if we're in year two here, five to six, seven plants developed um, and, and increasing as, as we get closer to 2030. Um, a lot of development has to take place uh, in order to meet these targets. I think I said it was, it's a scary graph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so key key aspect of development is site selection. So we just wanted to give a high level um, review of what developers look for in a site um, in terms of site suitability. So the first aspect um, is proximity to a sustainable and reliable feedstock supply. Um, and also DGS state receivers. So the key within that is to have all your feedstock supply and DGS state receivers within uh, a certain radius of your site. The closer, the better in terms of sustainability um, and reducing transport costs uh, and associated greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the visual I've included here is the, the plant we just used as an example there, where 99% of feedstock supply and DGS-8 receivers are within a 15 kilometer radius of that particular site. And proximity to gas grid. So we mentioned there that direct grid connection is the optimal um, in terms of operation, um, but there is, there is the option of the virtual pipeline as well. But, but with that comes operational headaches, we'll say, um, uh, to ensure that your virtual pipeline gets, gets the grid detection on time to come back um, to continue producing and, and capturing the gas in your, in your uh, MEGCs, which is the term for the, for the virtual pipeline trucks. Environmental impact, um, and particularly environmental impact assessment, key with a, uh, any development of this scale um, and, and should be a key part of site selection criteria. So your initial screening for particular environmental or ecological sensitivities, um, absolutely critical uh, in terms of development and application site. So at the scale we're talking about there, that sort of medium scale uh, development, um, uh, it will trigger an environmental impact assessment under uh, part two, class 11B of schedule five. Um, of the plan on development regs. So installations for the disposal of waste with an annual intake greater than 25,000 tonnes. So developers, in some cases, are scared of VAR because obviously it's an additional cost to them, but it's a huge opportunity for the developer to, to present a robust scientifically researched uh, argument for, for the benefits of the proposal. Um, and to allow for effective, formal, public and stakeholder consultation. So it's not something to be scared of. It's, it's certainly something that 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 should be encouraged and, and as a key part of, of applications of, of the scale. So having, having conducted a number of public consultations, uh, replan meetings on, on uh, developments of this scale, over and over, probably number one, concern from the public certainly is air odor and noise impacts. Um, so that's that's a key consideration within your environmental impact assessment and your application. So that can include um, dispersion modeling, such as the what we've visualized here, um, noise impact assessments, um, and also traffic and transport assessments. So again, 
joint first, if not second, in terms of the hit list of concerns by the public in relation to AD plants is the number of traffic movements, the type of traffic movements in terms of tractors, HTVs, um, the impact on the local road network and road safety. And landscape and visual impact. Um, with AD plants, just to to mention the trip to Germany last week, I was, I was struck uh, as we travelled through. We were travelling through the northwest, um, uh, North Rhine, Westphalia region, and northwest Germany. And I was struck just by the number of AD plants uh, on the landscape. Um, you couldn't go five or ten minutes on the bus before you saw an AD plant um, on the landscape somewhere or so. It's become accepted. Um, certainly in Germany, it's a proven technology. People are used to seeing biogas um, developments, but we're not used to seeing them here here in Ireland. Um, it's just not something the public are familiar with. Um, so landscape and visual impact um, and the incorporation of a landscape plan within an application we see as important to, to soften the visual impact of these within the landscape. Um, and public consultation, uh, without doubt, absolutely critical and a key part to to any any application uh, for for biogas development. Uh, the importance cannot be cannot be uh, overstated. There's been a number of high high profile stories in the press um, where there has been eighty plants have been negatively perceived, um, and this this is where the importance of effective uh, public consultation comes is important. Um, it's an opportunity for the public to relay, relay their concerns uh, at the design stage of the project um, and an opportunity for the, the developer to share information on the project and, and get get accurate information out there before before Chinese whispers start. Again, licensing. Uh, so within an AD plant of this scale, um, there will be two licensing regimes, uh, one under the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, um, and the other through the EPA or, or a local authority through through a waste license. So just to touch on this brief, briefly, as it is, it is a, a hugely important consideration. Uh, for DAFM approval, the, the regulations are under the Animal Byproduct Regulations, uh, and compliance with AB, ABP regulation must be addressed at the design stage. So there are critical design choices that, that must be included um, in terms of biosecurity. So in terms of the separation of clean and dirty areas um, and ABP feedstock and pasteurized digested, there must be clear separation uh, in terms of the plant design to ensure that there's no, no potential for crossover or, and contamination uh, between both, both of those. There are some uh, Conditions documents are published by the department that, that offer clear guidance uh, on the requirements. So key considerations um, in terms of the ABP regulation are ABP waste storage uh, and treatment, uh, the digested treatment um, itself, um, including pasteurization. A way bridge is a requirement, uh, obviously, to, to track your tonnage, tonnage in and tonnage out. Uh, biosecurity fencing uh, and vehicle cleaning in terms of wheel washes um, and steam cleaning. So the advice here is consultation um, on plant design to ensure uh, adherence to DAFM requirements prior to seeking a plan application. So this, this can be done through a first stage application to the Department of Agriculture, whereby you submit your plant layout um, and get approval and ensure compliance with, with the design guides. There's then second stage approval, uh, whereby you submit your operational procedures, has some plan and a validation plan. Um, the plant can't actually be validated and go through the validation process until it's constructed and commissioned, um, at which point uh, you will be issued a con conditional approval by DAFM which is a three three month temporary consent to operate, whereby you, you prove your your uh, you validate your processes uh, and your HACCP plan uh, and your operational procedures. I 
I mentioned briefly there that a waste license will be required in the form of a waste facility permit under local authority licensing uh, or an industrial emissions license from the EPA. So in terms of tonnages there, uh, if it's greater than 10,000 tonnes of bio waste, so organic waste per year, um, it will require an industrial emissions license um, and application to the EPA. If you're unsure, you can submit an Article 11 submission to the EPA for a written determination on the precise license requirements. Again, these license requirements and industrial emissions license requirements must be considered at the design stage through the incorporation of best available technology, but uh, bonding, absolutely critical as well, 110% capacity of the largest single storage vessel or 25% of the total volume. Um, so there, there's important considerations here um, on how your site is bonded uh, or how your operational areas are bonded um, to ensure that that capacity is there in the event of a failure. Older abatement, I touched on that briefly, generally negative pressure, uh, airtight building um, and older abatement through the likes of ammonia scrubbing, a biofilter, activated carbon filter bed and water noise and air emissions must be considered as well. So I hope that gives you a brief overview of the process, the technology involved. Uh, please feel free to put in any questions in the chat and we'd be happy to address them uh, towards the end. And Luke. Uh... Thanks, Oshin. So um, I, guess, I guess you've set the scene in terms of the environmental policy there. Um, and the overarching European directives, the climate action plans. Um, I guess just to start out, something uh, the, I guess is has been in the back of my mind. Um, the climate action plan is obviously updated yearly, and the targets uh, get updated as needed. We've recently had the uh, sectoral emission ceiling set for the for various sectors, including agriculture, obviously. Um, so there's a question there. I suppose does planning policy has planning policy kept uh kept up with that that change in environmental policy so there's a there's quite a clear hierarchy in terms of the the planning framework um the national planning framework obviously sits at the top of that um and that's a that's a document that dates from 2018 so it's it's due for update it was originally due to be actually published in draft uh i think around now uh but the latest i think is is probably around uh, june this year uh, we should see a draft document come through, um, and I, I guess from working on planning applications for for biogas facilities, something that I I guess you know as a as a planner feel there probably could be more of a focus on this technology, um, and a bit more kind of spatial planning guidance provided, right from that national level in the planning national planning framework down through the regional spatial and economic strategies, um. You know, they were broadly speaking around 2019. Most of those were published. Uh, so, so you know, th th I think there's a need to update the 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 higher levels of the, the the planning system really to 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 keep step with that the the enormity of the task, I guess, which is uh, which is ahead of us. Uh, the other thing that I, I guess from from working on projects in different counties uh, that we see is there is a degree of variation, I guess, in terms of how local councils have, have provided policy for for biogas so i won't uh, I won't name any names i guess but or or pick out particular plans but one thing that in particular we see uh some plans will there be quite a strong push towards industrial sites uh within or on on the edge of built up areas for this type of development other plans will i guess there'll be more there's, there's more of a recognition uh of some of those site selection criteria, Oshin, that you set out there at the, you know, in the in the presentation. Say, for example, the proximity to feedstock, uh, proximity to the the gas grid, um, and obviously transport is an issue, perhaps in some rural areas, but uh, you know, that's something that, that can be addressed where necessary. So, um, I, I I suppose if there was a if there was a wish list, it would probably be for, uh, you know, greater support at a national and regional level. And then that filtering down into 
you know, relatively consistent. Obviously, every county is different and it's for the, the local council and the elected members to make their development plans. But it would be good to see, you know, perhaps a, a greater degree of of consistency across plans. That being said, um, you know, the planning applications are dealt with at any given time based on the framework that's there. And, you know, it is broadly a supportive framework, uh, we would say, uh, which which does allow for projects to come forward in the short term. So that's uh, that's obviously the hope that that things can can move forward fairly swiftly. Uh, and I suppose we'll wait we'll wait to see the uh, the draft national planning framework when it comes out, and there'll hopefully be a good chance to to consult on that too. So I suppose in terms of that that kind of broader framework for for these applications coming forward. Uh, I guess most people would probably be aware of the draft national biomethane strategy that's been published by government. That is still open for public consultation. It was initially to be, I think it was to close today originally. Uh, it's been pushed out to the 5th of March. So there's still a chance there to to make your views known. So we've done a, a detailed review of that that draft document. And I won't speak to the um the the various kind of policy options that have been considered. There's there's consideration of um, different scenarios whereby you have a, a greater focus, for example, on uh, kind of on-farm AD plants, uh, right up to kind of more industrial scale solutions. Um, the reality probably is that there's going to be a combination of of both, and I think that's recognised in the in the draft. Uh, but from a planning pro policy perspective, I guess we see that document as a key uh, a key opportunity to set the the national policy on on these these developments and to bring a bit of clarity uh a, a, across the various different uh jurisdictions and, and development plans that you know uh it, it's an opportunity to effectively shift the dial we've seen that uh, government do that for example on data centers there's a new the, the, the latest data center policy in 2022 uh brought in a lot of requirements that have have been taken up by by industry i think uh, but also by planning authorities and board planola in in their decision making, so it it really is a it's a it's a key opportunity if we're to meet the the ambitious targets that have been set, uh, and I guess as it stands, there is a commitment there in the draft document to publish a code of practice for planning authorities. We don't have sight of that yet, so there's obviously hopefully that will provide some good detail and policy support. But I also think it's important that the document recognizes, you know, it it currently kind of recognizes that there can be impacts on foot of the development of these these plants. Um, I guess it should, I think, also recognize that those impacts you know, can be dealt with and mitigated effectively. Um, and also, I guess, you know, from a planning point of view, there are all the benefits that Oshin has gone through in terms of displacing uh, chemical fertilizers, improving water quality. Um, and, and, you know, uh, as you said, Oshin, I think the EIORs for these type of developments are an actual opportunity to get across uh, the positives on the scheme. Uh, I think uh, perhaps uh, consultants, myself included, maybe could be uh, accused of, you know, seeing EIA as, as a, a way to assess the negatives that, that might come out of a project. But I think it's very important for this type of development that the, the positives uh, come across very strongly as well. Um, and that it's shown, you know, clearly how any potential negative impacts can be and will be mitigated. Um, so I think perhaps we could move on to the next slide. So I'm just going to briefly uh, fly through the, the planning process. Um, now, what's going to come up on screen is probably a bit of a worst case scenario. So I'm going to move on to some more cheerful news after this, but uh, th this is kind of it as it stands. So uh, as Oshin said, a key a key aspect of the, the process of bringing forward one of these developments is to do a detailed feasibility study, look at your site selection, uh, look at the feasibility of the, the grid connection, feedstock supply, uh, where, where the digestate is ultimately going to go when it's produced, uh, and, a, and a review of the environmental and planning uh, sensitivities of the sites. So, you know, while that can kind of seem like a, you know, a, a heavy cost to to take at the at the outset of a process, it really does pay dividends. Uh, you know, for example, on the environmental side, Oshin, I guess you know 
th there could be there could be things kind of hiding in the long grass that that might actually make you shift a site you know ch choose a different site um or of course you know perhaps perhaps things you know every box is ticked and you can you can move on swiftly but either way it does give a degree of of comfort i suppose when you're moving forward into the the, the planning application preparation um and it could it could save save time at the other end too so as Ulshin said uh public consultation and uh consultation with the planning authorities are obviously of utmost, utmost importance uh, as you move forward so uh we we'd said perhaps about three months for the feasibility stage, three to six months here for the uh for the initial stage of the plant design, um and moving forward then into the the consultation with the planning authority, uh and and from there I suppose moving on swiftly into the the preparation of the planning application itself, the EI or documentation, and I guess while that's while that's ongoing, uh there is room for for. for further consultation with with local people um and indeed with the the planning authority there could be a, a need to to do repeat meetings to to work out any any points that have been raised so on submission of the application then as, as it stands and I'll get on to the new planning bill but there's there's a two month window there for the decision uh a request for further information if it does occur uh you know they're common common enough for for large scale developments i suppose uh you might allow one or two months there to prepare your response followed again by two months for the planning authority to consider the further information that's obviously in the case that there's an eior submitted if there's no eior or and no nas uh you're talking about four weeks there for a decision so then once you get your decision there's a one month appeal period and following that if you're unlucky to get an appeal uh, as it stands, you're looking at an eight to twelve month plus uh, window for a decision on your appeal. Now, at the moment, you know that that eight to twelve month period is probably more like twelve to eighteen months. Uh, we we're seeing it coming down, uh, and I'll get onto that a little bit later. But uh, you know, if, if an appeal was lodged today, you you perhaps put it at in that kind of a a ballpark. Um, but as I say, hopefully we'll see that see that reduce now obviously ultimately when you get your decision from on board planola there is an opportunity uh for participating parties and for some uh ngos etc to to take a judicial review against the decision um that is relatively uncommon although there is a recent judgment actually on a, a biogas facility uh, from the high court which which quashed the permission that was that was granted albeit the the reasons involved weren't really um biogas specific let's say they related more to a change in development plans during the the appeal process which kind of left a lacuna in the in the decision so um nothing in particular to focus on on that one i don't think um from the point of view of those looking at looking at applications but but worth being aware of it in any event um, so then following your grant of permission and hopefully no ju judicial review, uh, you can proceed with the uh, the lodgement of a, a an application for an industrial emissions license if one is required. Now, Oshin, I, I understand that in some cases there may be uh, an opportunity to to kind of run that concurrently to some, some extent. Agreement can be sought from the EPA, but, you know, potential developers... There's a huge risk involved. You going for your industrial emissions license ahead of a decision on planning. Um, of course, not, ma not many developers are willing to take that risk. Um, so there's there's certainly a need to shorten that timeline. Um, specifically in relation to the licensing process. Absolutely, much like the planning timelines. Yeah. So, uh, what what we have in there is twelve to eighteen months for for that process to to be undertaken with the EPA. Um. Which obviously is, if you're not uh, taking a more cavalier attitude, uh, that's going to be that's going to be tagged on to the end of your your planning timeline effectively. So, um, overall, you're looking the guts of of, uh, of four years in some cases if you're going through each step uh, one after the other. Longer potentially if you've got a judicial review, of course, um, depending on on whether there's any appeal of a 
a high court decision, for example. So um, it is a considerable timeline. And if we look at that in the context of the targets by 2030, you can really see that there's a need to to really get applications into the system and through the system as soon as possible. Um, you know, if we're if we're to to leave ourselves with a with a chance of 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 meeting that meeting that target, um, and obviously we're we're aware that there's similar challenges in in other renewable sectors, uh, particularly with with some of the the onshore and offshore winds. So, um, it's a it's kind of an ind industry wide uh, challenge, I guess. So this is uh, not to depress anyone, but this is a, <laughs> a recent example of a, a scheme that got through the planning process, um, just granted there by the board on the 19th of February, following an appeal. So the original planning application for this um, anaerobic digestion plant was, it was lodged on the 8th of February, 2021. So that's, uh, that kind of puts it in context, I suppose. They did have a further information request uh, got their decision to grant from the planning authority on the 7th of June 22, appealed within the month following that, um, and then has been with the board ever since until the 19th. So if we, if you break that down, three years and 11 days, 158 weeks in planning, um, and a, you know if they need an IE license, then you can tag that onto the end of it as well. So that's, uh, I guess that's where we're that's the the starting point that we're we have at the minute, um. There is some cause for hope, I think. I hope. Um, so th there's been a there's been a recognition, I suppose, um, at at central government level, that the the planning system needs to be geared up and resourced to deal with the challenges ahead, and uh, I suppose the the backlog that's currently existing. Um, so that that's involved, you know, a significant allocation of resources to onboard Planola. Where there's now 15 board members, uh, which is which is speeding up decision making considerably. Uh, there's a, a a good number of additional inspectors as well to to help resource the board. Uh, similarly, uh, there's been allocation of funding from central government for uh, hundreds of additional uh, planners at a local authority level. So all of that will serve to to hopefully bring back those appeal timelines to closer to the statutory objective of which is which is 18 weeks. Um, and certainly we'd be hopeful that, you know, any planning applications that are going into the system with the local authority or perhaps being thought about at the moment, uh, that they would they wouldn't get the same um level of delay that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. So yeah, just I, I guess there's a there's a glimmer of hope there and the board are exceeding consistently exceeding the uh in, in terms of decisions per week they're exceeding the number of new cases coming in so the, the the backlog is being is being eroded at this stage which is which is positive to see the other thing i suppose that's been done um there was a kind of a fairly long running review of the the overall planning legislation the planning and development act 2000 and the associated regulations by the attorney general's office uh, that's now resulted in the new planning and development bill uh, which is obviously currently in going through the Oireachtas, it's it sits at committee stage at the moment, um, and they have to they have the the lovely task of considering, I think it's a thousand one hundred and ninety four proposed amendments to the to the bill, which is seven hundred odd pages long. So, uh, there there's some good news in in that though as well, um, in terms of you know re revised revised processes around um planning applications, standard planning applications, also uh, strategic infrastructure applications to the board. Um, and uh, I guess there's also there's also revised timelines, which we'll, we'll get onto in a second. Um, the other positive, I guess, uh, th there was a, a real space of judicial review proceedings um, uh, over the last few years. A lot of those related to strategic housing developments. Uh, that process is obviously, there's, there's still some applications in the system. Which uh which seem to be stuck, but the uh the new large scale residential development process seems to have taken some of the heat out of the residential uh court challenges. Um, they're still obviously a uh, higher level than there there used to be, but um, it's obviously it's a challenge to keep up with that. How rapidly the case law was was coming out, um, so hopefully 
people can kind of take a breath, maybe get up to speed with some of that, um, which would hopefully reduce the risk on forthcoming applications as well. So this is just a brief overview. Um, people might be aware of it. There's actually, there's a good um, run through of the overall bill on our website. If people are interested, there's a, there's a kind of a, a cheat sheet there if, uh, if it's helpful. Um, but in terms of the timelines, uh, you're looking at applications without an EIO or NIS, an eight week decision timeframe from the council and four weeks if FI is sought. Uh, that's, that's as it stands at the moment. So no, no change there. The change comes in really where you've got an application with an EIO or NIS. So your, your timeline for the planning authority, it's gone up to 12 weeks. They can ask you if they can't make a decision on time uh, for additional time. And uh, you're kind of over a barrel to, to give them that time as it's currently drafted. Um, because if you don't, then, uh, the application is deemed to be refused and you can appeal it if you want to. Um, at appeal stage then, similarly, there's that differentiation between non-EA or, or NIS applications uh, with, a, with an 18-week time frame. Uh, also, that's the same as it stands um, with a, a longer 26 weeks provided for applications that do have an EA or, or NIS. Um, similarly, with the, with the board, as it stands, obviously they have statutory objectives to decide up, decide appeals. Um, that, the, I suppose that the, the timelines that are set out in the bill um, can be exceeded uh, in some circumstances, but there are steps in the bill to, um, well, effectively give the the board a slap on the a slap on the wrist if they if they can't meet those timelines. Um, so it will be interesting to see. I think um, the view from from the uh, the planning professional institutes and from from industry generally i think is that they're not too worried about uh kind of punishing decision makers for not making decisions on time they're doing their best uh and it's really about just resourcing the system um which i think is is something that's feeding through at the moment so um it's not all doom and gloom i think there is there's uh there's light on the horizon hopefully for the planning system uh so hopefully it doesn't put people off uh bringing these projects forward and you know the country moving towards actually uh, achieving the targets that have been set. So just to reiterate briefly there, um, as I said, that consultation on the draft national biomethane strategy, that's been pushed out uh, by the department. I think it was only extended there on Friday, but um, there's an extra few days to to make your views known. So obviously encourage everyone to to read the document and uh, perhaps engage in that in that process because the more views that uh, that inform it, the better. So um, that'd be welcome. Thanks all. Thanks for taking the time to listen in. Thanks very much to Ushin and Luke there for very interesting and, and thought provoking um, presentation there. Um, I think it was a, a great tour of the the process, the the planning, what's involved in planning and licensing, um, and timelines. Obviously, in the last um. Uh, section of the presentation and I suppose just there was also a look forward to the potential that's that's um, presented by the, the biomethane industry which is I suppose in its infancy um, in Ireland so um, we do have some questions coming through um, uh, Dennis uh, Carter have, has asked just in relation to the biomethane strategy um, contains three stra strategies one farm based um, and the, the third uh, commercial or industrial scale plants um, and the question I suppose poses is for the biomethane industry to thrive in Ireland, which do you feel should take priority, farm-based or cooperative style or larger industrial um, scale facilities? So I'm not sure if Luke or Oshin, Luke, you touched sure. on it. Sure, perhaps, there. yeah, I could jump in briefly. I'd say, Oshin, you might have uh, something to add there as well. But yeah, looking at the question, I suppose, um, there, there seems to be a bit of a concern there in the question, I guess, that that perhaps larger scale operations of this type could uh, result in, you know, the the buying up of significant swathes of farmland um, and the concentration of that in the hands of of a few operators with these type, type of plants. From from what I'm seeing um, from my own involvement in, in these projects to date, uh, I don't think there's any need for for concern in that regard 
um what we're seeing really is you know the the, the people who operate these plants they rely on local farmers uh primarily to to get the the feedstock um and also to um also to, to to use the digestate as well so um it's very much there is a kind of a cooperative aspect to them and i think honestly that's uh that's one of the the most important benefits there's a real there's an economic uh benefit for for the the local farmer and for obviously for the the producer of the the biomethane as well um so yeah i think and in terms of the strategy i think uh it seems to be the case that what's feeding through is reality will be a, a mixture of of the larger scale facilities and the the smaller scale ones on in a in a farm context so um but as i said earlier i think you know even the larger scale ones in many cases are appropriately located in planning terms in a rural area where they're proximate to the feedstock um obviously subject to you know other planning policy and requirements in, in the local development plan. So um that's that's my my tuppence on it anyway. I don't know, Oshin, would you have anything? Uh, no, I'd agree with everything you said there. Look, I think there's a place for for each scale, you know, as mentioned in the biomethane strategy, a mixture with a focus on that medium scale cooperative type model whereby there's multiple local agricultural operators supplying the plant, receiving the digestate and return. Um, an interesting conversation with an uh, an AD developer in Germany last week, uh, just in the terms of employment generated by by these sites, um, and and the rule of thumb they use is one megawatt electrical in terms of production, they equate to ten direct jobs, um, so there's you know local sustainable jobs is a huge factor here as well, um for people with agricultural skills, not just people with, well, there's very few people with direct biogas experience in Ireland. Um, um, so generally the, the employment pool will be from people with an agricultural background. Um, so I, I don't see the large, huge industrial scale plants becoming overly dominant. Um, I think that cooperative model is, has, a, has a critically important place in, in, in the industry as it develops. Thanks, Oshin. Thanks, Luke. Um, so, Anthony McFadden and um, Meryl Goddard have uh, similar questions around wastewater sludges um, and wastewater plants networks being used for producing biogas. Might leave that one to Oshin. <laughs> uh, can, can wastewater sludges be used? Yes. Yeah. Um, the first answer is. AD can be applied and wastewater treatment plants themselves and is widely applied um, throughout the island of Ireland. Um, there's complications taken in wastewater treatment sludges to AD plants that are co-digestion with animal byproducts. Um, you're, you're introducing, potentially introducing that um, back into the human generated waste back into animal waste and there's issues there there's waste licensing issues there um waste sludges from food process the likes of abattoir waste um brewery waste um, a lot more acceptable so there is complications there in terms of waste licensing okay um, thanks, Oshin. Um, Anthony uh, McFadden asked again, just in relation to, to Germany, would you say that Germany is more stringent owners planning or mostly similar uh, to what potential developer would see here in Ireland? My experience is based on conversations, um, not direct, um, but I visited a site last week. Um, it was an existing AD plant um, processing about 40,000 tonnes of agricultural waste um, and they went for to extend the plant to double the capacity of it essentially. And they were constructing um a seven and a half thousand meters cube capacity digester um with a twenty-two meter tank wall height. And it got through the planning system in twelve weeks. Yeah. Um so <laughs> if you compare that to Luke's timeline or the outline there, it's night and day. There's a lot of factors within that. There's there's Policies changes on the back of the need for Germany to secure 
um, a renewable gas supply, given their reliance on on natural gas from from Russia, following the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, so there is so, that policy to to back that up. Um, plus okay. accept, acceptance, um, and and the public of AD developments. Hmm. There, there's there's a wide understanding of the process. There there. They're used to seeing any development, so the the risk of objections is lessened. That's that's a huge huge issue, really. Um, and like I think there's there's some good research there on on people's acceptance of say the likes of a, a wind turbine or a solar farm in their local landscape. And there's you know views are pretty positive. I think broadly speaking, um, it'd be interesting. I, I'm not sure if I've seen anything on on uh, this type of development in an Irish context. The I guess people just probably haven't seen them and that's the reality. So um what's new can be can be scary. So they think there's a there's a real um there's a real need for for good public information and um education on the what these entail and um the 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 benefits they can bring for a local area as well as for, for the country, for Ireland Inc. in terms of, you know, climate targets. So yeah. Okay, well, I'm just um, conscious that we're we're pushing over the the hour here. So, um, if it's okay with everyone, we will capture the the questions here and we'll we'll respond directly to to any that are outstanding. But, uh, once again, just thanks to Ushin and Luke for their time today and a, a very interesting and thought provoking um, presentation and indeed questions and answer after. So, thanks again. <laughs>